Welcome to Backyard Philosophy, a podcast where a couple friends grab some cold ones, sit around the fire, and talk about science, philosophy, and history. Crack one open, sit back, and get a good laugh as we discuss everything from automation to why the meaning of life is 42. Oh, I'm not stupid, Lucius. No one lives forever. No one. But with advances in modern science and my high-level income, I mean, it's not crazy to think I can't live to be 245, maybe 300. Heck, I just read in the newspaper that they put a pig heart in some guy from Russia. Don't put that evil on me, Ricky Bobby. Nick, well, you're not Ricky Bobby, but it is a possibility we can live to be 245, 300 years old. And we're getting closer and closer to that. We're going to be talking about nanobots. And first off, before we go into nanobots, Nick, how you doing and what are you drinking? I'm a little hungover, and I'm drinking a Pabst Blue Ribbon hard coffee. Very nice. You're drinking some coffee and you're a bit hungover? I love it. I'm not joining you with some coffee. I'm just having some quality H2O. Now, nanobots. I, nanobots hurt my brain. When you get onto the micro and nanoscale, it's, uh, engineering gets very complicated. For those who don't know, Nanobots are pretty much tiny machines that we make and put into dumpster sites, human bodies, pretty much anywhere microscopic. Now, the idea of nanobots was first brought up in 1959 by a Richard Finman, but nanotech didn't really get its roots until about 1974 by Professor Tanaguchi. Then, in the 1980s, huge explosion. And by the end of the 1980s, it became a full field of study at universities. Another big milestone was in 2001, which kind of gave a little kick, a little steroid to the investigation of nanobot technology. In 2001, the FDA approved the first smart pill, a pill that would go down a person's body either with a video camera or would take samples. And from there, nanotech has skyrocketed. Now, to give some scale on how big nanobots are, well... They kind of range, depending on what their purpose is and how they're made. Nanobots range from 0.1 to 10 micrometers. And just for scale of that, a width of a human hair is about 65 micrometers. So, yeah, nanobots are small. Now, nanobots, how they get into your body, we'll talk a little bit. But how you make a nanobot is kind of up to your imagination. There are multiple ways, depending on the nanobot's purpose. One way... It's through an old practice, which is lithography. You take a thin piece of platinum, about 7 micrometers thick, then you coat one side with an inactive material. Scientists and researchers have been mainly using graphene. Then you cut the desired shape through the lithograph process, which I believe came out in the 1800s. Another way is to take tiny rare earth magnets, about 5 micrometers in size. These magnets are usually... Uh, neodymium ion boron magnet, so quite common for permanent magnet field. Uh, you magnetize them and then you mix them into UV resin. Now, I want you all to envision this because this process I absolutely love because I, I love magnets. So you take that mixture of resin and magnets and you kind of scrape it in almost like you're doing drywall into a mold. The mold is only about seven microns, sorry, sorry, seven micrometers in height. Then the mold is put over a permanent magnet with Say we'll put north up first. Then that magnet underneath the other little ma- above underneath the other little magnets will make all those other magnets polarized to a certain direction, and they'll use UV light to solidify certain parts. So you don't want to completely solidify the resin altogether. You want to do sections. So imagine almost like a chessboard. Then after you completed all the white spaces on the check checkerboard, you flip the permanent magnet underneath the mold to south pole. Then you do the then you flip it over the permit magnet underneath to the south pole, then use the V light to finish up all the other black pieces on the checkerboard. This will create contradiction. So using magnets, you can make them bend and contract and and come together, and that creates movement inside of a body. And that's one big way magnets are being moved around in your body. Magnets. Magnets, lasers, UV lights, they just simply float around. But I assume we'll get into that in a little bit. So it's important to have different types of nanobots because they're kind of like uh, plug-and-play machines. They need to do different parts. 
there are, I guess, one I was really fascinated with is imagine a hexagon, and at the edges of all the hexagon, there's triangles. And with magnets, you can control those flaps. So you can turn that hexa that shape into a three-dimensional shape, make it flat 2D. You can grab stuff, jump, turn into a ball and roll around. It's amazing. There was one test done where they walked their nanobot, and again, this is micro scale. They walked a nanobot, picked up a sample, rolled it up a ramp, dropped off the sample, and then went back to its initial spot. That's happening at 1 60th of a scale of a human hair. Just want to put that out there. But moving them is kind of a new emergence. We can make them pretty well, but controlling them and moving them is the difficult part. Now, I want to clarify, there are non material nanobots. There are biological nanobots, which is emerging field. For example, there's a nanobot that is controlled with ultrasound, but they are, well, they're not quite controlled yet. You can sort of predict them using supercomputers and based on their shapes and a little help with the ultrasound, but they're made from stem cells. These are called xenobots. They're like bio nanobots. So the material is living cell. The xenobot, made by researchers at the University of Vermont and Tufts University, are made from frog embryo stem cells, specifically Xenopus levius. That's where the name Xenobot comes from. So I guess Alex Jones will probably talk about frogs some more once that comes more into public news. But Xenobots are really interesting because they like to stick together. They will form and clump together. Cells like to do that. Unfortunately, to actually make nanobots like them that are bio, you have to manually put it together. There's no chemical or machine process to do that. So Nick, I, I have to tell you this because this is going to hurt your head. They, there are researchers at these universities, I imagine it's grad students, that meticulously sewed and put together stem cells to create nanobots by hand. No thank you. Would you want to do that? I would not want to do that. I would not. There's so many things that grad students do that I would not want to do. <laughs> Poor grad students. They get worse than interns. No, but xenobots and biotech, is, to me, is an interesting field. It's still relatively new, even at 2020, but they have some benefits some, and some downsides. Xenobots can survive weeks without food. They can self-heal. But again, we can't quite program them yet, but I'm, I'm optimistic. Well, that's enough of possibilities. We'll get to more in those later, but I think it's here to talk about what we all wanted to talk about. What is happening in the medical world with nanobots? And Nick, why don't you start us off? What have you found or want to discuss about nanotech in the medical world? So there's obviously a lot going on, but I think the biggest would be help. Biggest help is the nanobots that are in your body, but mostly just observing things. So looking for cancer cells or early warnings of other diseases and essentially acting as like your car's um, heads up display and your check engine light that will then come play back to some computer or something or some some way we can get the data from them that there's something going on and then you know go and have it taken care of because most things you check get it early it's not gonna it's easier to treat it before it gets too far time is always key of the essence for me, Nick, I, the advancements in nanotech means to me like more complicated and higher stress rate surgeries, like non-invasive surgeries. One field, which I assume it came up somewhere in when researching this, was cancer research. So from what I can tell, a lot of the nanobots currently in development and being tested are for cancer. I It was hard finding ones not for cancer. I think a big part was simply assisting surgeons. So in the medical world, which helped promote nanobots, there was a thing called quantum dots. Quantum dots, their real name is also known as cadmium selenide. So I'm not gonna say that again. That's, I, it, I messed my words up too much. Quantum dots glow when they're exposed to ultraviolet light. So they're usually injected into areas where there are tumors. So when a surgeon opens up a patient and goes to remove a tumor, all the tumor cells are glowing. So you know exactly what to cut out and what to leave in. Because for those who don't know, removing tumor isn't just usually removing the tumor. It's usually removing a lot of the cells around that tumor just to be 
sure that you got them all kind of like a slash and burn almost process but like i said cancer i think is the forefront of nanobots in medicine another use in nanobots in the cancer world is drug delivery system which i'm sure me and nick will expand on mainly I, what i saw was in chemotherapy they can target specific cells usually a two-part system nanobots that go out and detect where the cancer cells are kind of like nick was saying with that pre-warning or kind of seech and destroy and then the other group of nanobots bring in medicine to kill the cancer cells. Like that hexagon with triangles at the end. It can grasp around molecules of that medicine and carry it to its destination and then release it. A company actually using this is, I uh, can't quite remember the name, but they're using a necrosis faster attached to nanobots, which is kind of a, it's kind of like a chemical that helps kill cancer cells. Then they coat the nanobots with trial divertized polyethylene glycerol, also known as PAG thiol, which is very important when we're going to be talking about nanobots because that's the chemical used to hide the nanobots from your white blood cells so your body doesn't attack the nanobots. Because Nick, I don't know about you, but it would suck if I took medicine and all of a sudden my body rejected the medicine and just tried to destroy the medicine that would save my life. Yeah, for sure. And it, I always think it's funny that obviously your body identifies foreign objects and attacks them but a lot of this is about you know basically improving your immune system or forming a synthetic immune system for people who may or may not you know if you don't have an immune system you can kind of they're hoping that we can replace those with nanobots but there are an invasion to our body and our body would normally attack anything floating around in the blood and your anywhere in your body that doesn't belong yeah its body is very good at keeping us alive, but sometimes it needs help, and sometimes it knows, doesn't know that we're trying to help it. But I want to stick on cancer for a little bit because it's near and dear my heart and it affects many people's lives. So I want to talk about this really cool nanobot, or a really cool capability that nanobots might have in the future that MIT are undergoing develop. Nanobots that are able to pass through the brain barrier. They can pass through the brain barrier to target glidoblastamine, it's a deadly type of brain cancer. So we might not have to do open brain surgery to f help people with brain cancer. We might be able to just stick a needle in them, inject them with some nanobots, and let the nanobots go to the brain. That's, that's, my, that's the future, Nick. I mean, we live in the future. Yeah, that is, that is wild. I mean, surgery is getting less and less invasive already with you know robots and stuff like that. But to not even have that, and think about how much more sterile that is than opening up your your skull oh yeah being exposed to the air i don't care how sterile it is that's it's there's still got to be what dust breathing skin, like skin cells falling off like even it's minute it could cause complications everything matters when a life is on the line and like you were mentioning nick with helping our body and maybe people with weaker immune systems uh, kind of have a synthetic immune system nanobots don't have to do all the work they don't have to just deliver medicine or there's some nanobots that actually physically laser and like grasp on and rip off uh, cancer cells so they physically attack it. But a lot of a lot of nanobots are being used to just simply assist, not be the forefront, but assist the body. At the University of Toronto, actually, they found that using magnesium dioxide helps the efficiency of some chemo drugs like uh, doxyrubicin. So researchers at the university pretty much are coding nanobots to help deliver magnesium dioxide so pretty much it's just assisting the medicine that you're already getting making sure it's more efficient i guess the easiest way to say it is imagine a fire you, you know you got the embers already going the that's kind of burning but blowing a little extra air into it getting that more oxygen makes the fire burn better and that's kind of what some nanobots are doing well yeah and it's getting that medicine like you said where it needs to go so you know everyone takes like a uh, aspirin or tylenol or whatever it goes into your stomach and from there it gets in your body but there's there's a higher concentration because it's not all going to be absorbed that way so you put in there enough to some of it gets wasted and some you, enough of it makes it through to that is usable to you but if the nanobots can use less of the carrier or less of the medicine by just putting it where it needs to go put it into the bloodstream or wherever it its end goal is in that way you're using less you're putting less in your body just making everything more efficient and efficiency is key like we were i mentioned it a little bit already i'll elaborate on it but different delivery methods pretty much swallow a pill the pill dissolves and releases the nanobots 
an injection going to your bloodstream, a big, a big component of what I see with current and probably future technology nanobots is injections, just inject into your, your arteries or veins and, and possibly if you have a more terminal disease, you inject it into that zone immediately. Because again, our robots right now are kind of simple. It's hard to control them. It's, I'll talk a little bit more a little bit later in the podcast on how we move them and possible futures of moving them, but that's kind of the key. They're kind of just, um, I guess the best way to describe it is they're kind of like dumb bees. They have a hive mind, but can't really do any critical or adapting thinking. They're really good at one thing, and that's the only thing they can do. That is verbatim. Bravo. That was nail on the head, Nick. But luckily, we don't have to just always swallow pills or get injected with needles for those who fear needles. Nanobots don't even have to enter your body through that process. Scientists at Purdue University are using silicon nanoneedles. So yes, it's still needles, but they're so small, you don't feel them pierce your skin. Like, you won't feel anything at all. And they're developing wearable patches to help deliver medicine to fight melanoma. Like I said, Nick... Lots of research is being done with nanobots and cancer, and it's I'm all for it. But man, this is, I, there's other diseases like like you were mentioning, Nick. Early warning systems, simply nanobots that would float around in your bloodstream, collect a sample once in a while, and see if that RNA is changing or de- de- uh, develop it. See if see if the cell is not growing. Just you know, doing. Seeing if there's mutations at all, which would be early stages of cancer, just an early warning system, just like Nick mentioned. And I think it's important to mention a lot of these nanobots, like I mentioned earlier with the platinum and carbon nanotubes, isn't always just that. Sometimes they plate them in gold and silver. Uh, Actually, a lot of them are plated in gold and silver. And there's some really good reasons for that. Don't worry. It's not your tax dollars going to waste. Uh, If I remember correctly, gold isn't biologically inert. So your body doesn't detect it. It's why. So it's like why astronauts at NASA they have a lot of gold parts. It's simply because it doesn't. It's really stable. Doesn't really decay. Helps keep keep it clean because of micro ability. And then with silver, silver for eons has been used as an anti anti antivirus antibiotical system. There's there's civil there's silver like peroxide or something like that. It's supposed to be really good for you. Like ancient cultures used to throw. Um, silver coins in the bottom of their well to help purify the water so silver has been a natural a natural aid to the human body's health for a very long time and we still use it in the medical field i was gonna the only thing i could think of is uh the gold and silver just remind me of uh the stealth tech from the expanse (laughs) uh you would not want that for stealth but gold and silver are quite reflective and silver is i think the most conductive material that's naturally made so that'd be very bad for stealth technology but speaking of it kind of goes on what you just said there nick with stealth technology the shape now for stealth fighters the shape wants you don't want it to naturally reflect back and for medical the shape helps the nanobots or other procedures be more efficient and for an example uh they found that disc nanobots so nanobots that are pretty much flat like a pancake they are more efficient at attacking most cancer cells than sphere nanobots. So shape does matter. Like the amount of supercomputing and design going into the nanobots is hugely important because at this scale, you can't, it's not like a car where you can add all these complex features. It's not large enough you can see. You're dealing with a finite space. You can't even put a battery in them. You can't put a controller in them. You're making them so simple machines that can do complex tasks. So shape is a huge, huge component. That's why I'm very cur- very curious and very optimistic for bio nanobots because with biology, it's easier to store larger forms of te- uh, information. Like a strand of DNA can, you know, create a human body. And if I believe correctly, there was a DNA computer or bio computer made which could technically hold every information in the world currently on it, which is, and it was about the size of like one meter by one meter by one meter. So... Biotech to me is a future in medical career, but getting a little bit away from cancer, nano nanobots are being used for a wide range. Now we mentioned that nanobots are just floating around in your body, like they can't like they can be. That's an easy procedure because they don't have to move, they don't have to do certain tasks. They can just 
go with the flow and pick up things along the way, almost like a jellyfish in the ocean. Now, engineers at the University of California, San Diego are developing nanobots that continuously float around in your blood, cleaning your blood. They use nanobots, float around, target antibiotical resistant bacteria, and clean it and kill it. That sounds wonderful. Imagine not really having the option of getting an infection anymore. Or even more, imagine if you get hot, exposed to high radiation, maybe you could have nanobots that eat the radioactive particles in your body so it doesn't spread. Like it doesn't cause that mutation. Your nanoparticles in your body kind of protect you. These nanobots are being developed to act as sensors, like Nick mentioned earlier, early warning devices. They're also being used to help assist the body grow. So there's some nanobots being used for bone repair. Pretty much these nanobots are made to assemble themselves into like a scaffolding, I guess is the best way to say it, to help bone regrow. So bones are very important. It's kind of where new blood comes from, kind of need bones. So making sure they heal right and making sure, you know, we don't get an infection like bone marrow entering the bloodstream is kind of important. Wouldn't you say so, Nick? Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. And like Nick mentioned earlier with taking Advil or Tylenol, the process of getting that drug into your bloodstream. So I can't remember which kind of over-the-counter painkiller it is, but it's quickly activated with caffeine because it helps break down in your stomach, which helps then get it more released quicker into your bloodstream, which quicker pain release, but it doesn't last as long. But with nanobots, they could act as time capsules as needed. So imagine a person who needs to take insulin or has um, a rare food allergy. Instead of always carrying an EpiPen with them or insulin with them, just natural nanobots with a timer will release the insulin they need to continue to live. That sounds like, imagine once a month simply drinking a uh, one liter water bottle of, of nanobots and then you're good for the entire month so you don't have to constantly check into your insulin or if you go into cardiac arrest or if you're esophagus closes off from an allergic reaction, the nanobots automatically take care of it. It's almost a preemptive preaction defense mechanism to have. It's it's like carrying a medical bag with you everywhere you go, but it's inside your body. Or in the future, which I'll mention now, but I want to discuss more, is in the military field, imagine them plugging wounds. You get shot, get shrapnel, nanobots help form around the skin. And it is possible, like it's not that far away. There are nanobots that are being used to help with uh, with scar tissue. Now, you might think, oh, I'm sorry, Nick, I feel like I'm talking a little bit. I'll let you, let you have a word. No, I, I don't have too much to add. I, I do want to say about, um, going a little bit backtracking, when you're talking about the immune system, so a lot of the stuff I read about was how they're using going to use nanobots to create an immune system for people who have an immune disorder so that they you know, have better defense against everything they come across in life. But of course, humans, we want to make everything better. So we can make, say, if we are able to replace these people immune systems with nanobots that target bad cells and all that kind of thing, eventually it's we're going to put it in all of our immune systems to upgrade all of our immune systems because if it's good works for them it's going to work for us and maybe we're lacking in ways we didn't know and it's just going to lead to a constant race and i don't know if we want to talk about it now or later but i didn't really come across too much about this but at what point do humans stop breeding or do we stop naturally creating an immune system and completely reliant on these machines just because we haven't had to use it See, I'm so happy you brought that up. I I'm, I couldn't come across much research that, but if we have a crutch and we always lean on the crutch, what, I mean, if we're eventually going to lose it, you don't use it, you lose it. Nick, I'm so happy you brought that up because, I mean, yeah, it's great for nanobots to help people with sickle cell disease, but a natural human body that's healthy and good to go, does it really need it? Will the body kind of shut down and be like, oh, I don't need, like calluses. We develop calluses to help protect our skin, but... If we don't use it, our calluses kind of go away a bit, or at least they're not as thick. And Nick, before I continue, I want to I want to hear more on your opinion. So, um, oh man, I was reading a book, and I can't remember the name of it, but I'll, I'll bring it up at the end. So they were talking about how what this is going to lead to is possibly almost two types of humans because of technology or other factors you, we kind of split apart from each other you're going to have in in the book they referred to them as enhanced humans so people who had augmented immune systems they're 
you know, they had, they, un we would unlock certain things in the brain that would allow people to study better and, you know, read a book once and comprehend it kind of stuff like that. And then you'd have your regular people who maybe don't do that. They don't have an enhanced immune system, almost creating like a separate class. And whether they do that for, you know, religious reasons, personal reasons, not everyone's going to want to put a bunch of tiny robots into their body. But those people who don't do it are at a serious disadvantage because they will be more susceptible to disease in the short term. But in the long term, it might be those people who survive the quote unquote enhanced humans who have the augmented immune system because like you said mike if you don't use it you lose it if you don't have an immune system and say something happens where you can't you can't your nanobots or whatever you suddenly have to maybe you're 30 years old and have been relying on nanobots to fight all of your bacteria and viruses that come into your body and something happens and your body has to pick up the slack but it's your they just it just doesn't have the experience it doesn't have the adaptability yeah, to do that. And so if we rely too much on machines, we lose that thing that allows us to survive without them. We be in t or If we're entirely dependent on them, it could be bad for the human race. And I see both sides. You know, I, I can see how this would be good and how when this does happen, people are going to do it because, well, in the short term, it'll be benefit them and us. I mean, no one wants to get sick. But generationally... But what is it, yeah, what is it going to do in the long term? We just, we just don't know. Or are, am I just a Luddite who doesn't want to embrace new technology? <laughs> no, Nick, at, to me, it feels a bit like a brave world a little bit where genetically engineered humans and they're perfect, but for how long? It's, you're removing biological factors. Like, like we've all had chicken pox here in like, the United States. You're supposed to get it to help protect against diseases down the line. What happens if those nanobots never help protect? Like, and you never get the chicken pox. Or what happens if we start giving it to kids? What if those nanobots make sure the kids never get sick, which I think every parent wants, but it would such weaken the immune system if something happens in their gene sequence. Because I don't think people realize getting sick and you come over it naturally helps your immune system a bit. It helps your body, I guess, prepare more, take more shock more damage but when you have later in life when your dna markers start doing i don't know more susceptible to heart disease or something like that granted you could argue that nanobots are preventing that but say there's one not preventable it's just in your dna your body's so much weaker and it's going to be such more devastating to get like if you never had a cold and you have a cold for the first time and you're like say you're 50 you might die it's, I guess, an example that's happening in our modern world with is respirators. When your body becomes so reliant on machines, it starts think it stops thinking for itself. And we're seeing that with respirators today during these pandemic times. And sticking with, I guess, DNA is the, I don't know if it's a holy or unholy, Nick, but the holy, unholy combination of CRISPR and nanobots. Now, we mentioned CRISPR a lot. We'll eventually do a full episode on CRISPR, but... It, CRISPR's here to stay, and it's an amazing tool. But with nanobots, it could be supercharged. So CRISPR, for those who don't know, usually is before an organism's fully alive. So if I wanted to make tomatoes taste like peppers, you usually do that like in the early age of the seeds before it's full grown. It's kind of hard to change a grown organism. But with nanobots, could be a possibility. Nanobots could hold on to that CRISPR bacteria and deliver it right where it needs to be so it has that better effect on full-grown adults or full-grown species, which means changing an already existing organism into something else. It's If that's not sci-fi or Greek mythology, I don't know what is. And it's being done. Like, they're trying to do it at, I'm going to mispronounce this very, very horribly, and I apologize, at Fred Hutchinson's Cancer Research Center. They are doing just that. They are trying to use nanobots to help with CRISPR modifications. Imagine this might be a real possibility. You're not happy with your height at the age of 27. You might be able to, not probably in this century, but maybe in the following centuries, if CRISPR doesn't full on take over with CRISPR babies and we stay on the current path, eject nanobots with CRISPR cells to augment and change your height. That, my friends, is scary. It's amazing, but scary. It's like watching lightning strike. Yeah, and it, it's not going to stop there. Eventually, oh man, what was it? But they're talking about a world world where 
you know, you can select whatever genes for your children and, you know, intelligence, athleticism, stuff like that. It'd be sweet to, uh, if we could change it so that people, big business, hair loss, right? Stop that. Everyone look good forever. <laughs> I don't know. Some people rock bald. Some people look good bald. But it, it should be up to their choice. They shouldn't have to make that. I agree with that. But Nick, can I uh, can I scare you a little bit with nanobots? Well, just uh, trying to wrap my head around nanobots was scary the entire time. But yeah, go ahead. Okay, it's going to get way worse because this is done by a grad student by himself. Like his professor barely even helps. Like this is just current grad student. I think is in 2019. So maybe he's graduated, maybe not. I don't know. But to be able to read a human's nervous system, to read their nerve signals. Robert Bauer at Schaefer School of Engineering and Science has and is developing nanoparticles to read human nervous system. Uh, the, I just want to point this out because the material is kind of important to me because as an engineer. Uh, the material he's using is lead, zirconium, titanium, also known as PZT. Uh, zirconium is kind of huge in the engineering, science, chemistry, biology world because zirconium structures are really good at making molds. So you like if you want to create a new type of like carbon nanotube or uh you want to you have a very poor system like zirconium is used constantly and zirconium is so cheap too so zirconium when i hear zirconium i hear cheap which is kind of scary but being able to read another person's nervous i could tell how i could actually physically feel how you feel nick might be a real possibility because a grad student is doing this which makes me feel like what am i doing with my life but I could, you and your wife could physically connect on lay on layers that have never been felt before by human by humanity. You could taste what the other one was tasting. You could feel what the other one was feeling. You could possibly, if we could figure out how to do it with neurons, think how the other one was thinking. Ooh, I don't know if I want that. I don't know, but I I don't think I want that at all. But imagine it. It would be interesting though for like pain management in hospitals because that's a big problem is everyone has different you know pain tolerances and trying to figure out how much pills to give someone when the pain is you know on the one to ten scale how much does it hurt is different for every person even at the same injury but if you could see how much pain they were actually in that would stop people from you know faking pain to get pills as well as figuring out how much medicine to prescribe to reduce pain to a level that's manageable nick I love that idea, and I got another one run by you. Nick, I assume we've all been to the doctor's office or a hospital going, trying to explain how, what's happening to us, and we're not exactly the best at doing that. Imagine a doctor who could plug into you and feel exactly what you're feeling. So if, say, you, your leg feels really weird, like your hip feels really weird, the doctor could feel it himself on a nervous system system and go, oh, I know exactly what that is. I, can, I know exactly what you're talking about now because I feel what you feel. And then disconnect. Granted, it also seems like a really good torture device, but I feel like that in the medical world, it's huge to talk about pain. Or imagine a kid, a, like an infant, who's crying. They don't, they can't explain what they what they feel like. They might have an ear infection. There might be something more serious. A doctor could f- feel how that kid's feeling and I, kind of identify what was happening with the kid. What's what organ hurt, so we can we can look deeper into it. Like maybe. Maybe it's not an ear infection. Maybe the kid's heart, so it's not beating right or it's super, it's super fast and it's not coming on EKG because it's like a small leak. That doctor could maybe feel that, like, oh, it hurts everywhere, but my heart feels more weird than ever. That is, might be possible with nanobots, which, well, granted, we're still far way out there. This nanobots, even though came out in 1959, at least the idea of them, we're still in very early stages. We're, it's like, I would say we're behind in nanobots compared to AI, and AI is even a newer field. Nanobots is, it's amazing what we can do, but we're still a long ways off. So Nick, could you, uh, how would you feel if your doctor could plug in to help identify your pain or illness? Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know if I want that. It's like an invasion of privacy almost, isn't it? Yeah, it's weird to think about. But it's, it's possible, and it's, it's something that could become normal. Oh, okay, like imagine... You have nanobots around your nervous system. Actually, you might not even need your entire nervous system. You might need just one around your brainstem. And you go to the doctor's office. They plug in. They feel you. And they go, okay. And they inject syringes and wherever it's hurting full of nanobots to fight whatever problem you're doing that. Instead of, you know, if you've seen the back of a pharmacy, it looks like um, like M&M factory where you can dispense M&Ms. Like there's a whole 
row after row, columns after columns, shelves after shelves of just pills that they they open up to count out and just do stuff like that. Imagine that with nanobots. Like, okay, I need one for clogged arteries. Okay, I go to aisle three, row four, and five up. Okay, dispense. How many how many nanobots I need? Oh, I need um I need fifty cc's. Okay, that works. Let's let's go grab that, check that in, call it a day. That could be a real possibility. Pills could be very different from what they are because pills might not be in a capsule. For like, I don't know how familiar you are with this, Nick, but take the bloody medicine how it says on the pill. Like the amount of times I've seen people swallow B12 is aggravating. B12 is such a weak molecule that your stomach acid completely destroys it. You have to have that like you have to like die dissolve it in your mouth or inject it like stuff like that will be gone you can just literally just pop a pill or inject it into you or with nano needles not even feel it just put a patch on you and you're good to go you don't even swallow or feel anything which might be good for infants who have a hard time swallowing and don't like needles literally just put a patch on them and they're good to go yeah that's that's pretty crazy then i mean i can definitely see that i mean everything's becoming more and more targeted and efficient means of you know, giving medicine giving uh whatever compound to where it is so that that really wouldn't surprise me that much that uh we moved away from pills and more of a targeted treatment with uh needles and nanobots hey nick can i scare you again i'm still not completely over the f- reading a nervous system but sure okay well like you just said, assisting medical professionals in their procedures. In 2019, to me, a huge moment. I didn't really get any tabloids, but this is kind of like, come on, guys. We're, we're missing the big picture here. Nano, something big happened in nanotech in 2019. At Boston U- Children's Hospital and at Medical of Harvard, bioengineers and surgeons came together. And they combined another holy, I'm hoping holy, because it could turn out to be unholy trinity. They combined... AI, nanobots, and humans. We all came together to do a robotic seizure. Uh, not a, not sorry, not a robotic seizure. A procedure? I'm not quite sure how to say it if with with both robotics, humans, and AI. It's it's quite complicated. But they made a robotic catheter for heart su- heart surgery that can nam the AI can navigate autonomously up to the catheter to all the way to the human heart. Once it gets there. The AI notifies the surgeon. The surgeon then takes over. The surgeon then uses nanobots to help seal around the heart valve where it's leaking blood or or some other procedure. And they've done this with a synthetic human and a pig body with complete success. So imagine a doctor who just puts an AI and uh, a machine in you, gets to where it needs to go. Doctor, go get some coffee, comes back, takes over, calls it a day. That AI nanobots and humans sounds like an awesome rock band name, but also scary as hell. First off, anytime you mention catheters, I'm scared. <laughs> Aren't we all? Aren't we all? But yeah, that is that is pretty pretty wild. I mean, what do you, at what point do we not need the humans anymore, though? It's getting to that point because like non-invasive surgeries where you just swallow pill might be right around the corner. One might be able to swallow a pill or a capsule full of nanobots and simply fix themselves. A no, no longer needing nurses and surgeons and doctors, which I don't know how I feel about that because on an overview, it's like, oh, great. Everyone's healthy. We don't need anything like that. On a bigger picture, I'm like, that, that seems a little weird and something's not Something smells fishy, but I'm not quite sure. Do you know do you know what movie I'm thinking of right now? Oh god. You're trying to think of where everyone's healthy. No, I'm trying to think of where there's not doctors in the hospital. What's the one with Arnold Schwarzenegger? No, I'm talking about idiocracy. Oh god. I god, I don't know how it escaped me. I love that movie. It's such a great satire in humanity. Oh, it's so <laughs> toilet water? <laughs> oh. If you, for all those who haven't seen Interocracy, early 2000 movies, highly go recommend. It's a great satire on humanity. But they, there's basically no smart people left, and you go to the hospital, and you tell the lady where it hurts, and she pushes a button, and then the machine just treats you automatically. Which might happen. Talk about, if you don't use it, you lose it. We are, lo- like, I keep thinking back of, by the time Cleopatra became in power, they forgot how to build the pyramids. If you don't use your brain, you lose it. And I, I'm just happy I'm in this 
time frame in history where I can still have my brain and technology. I can have kind of best of both worlds. Yeah, I don't know. It's uh, It seems really good, right? Everything that's going on, but it's we're going to have less death, live longer, look better, feel better. But is that a benefit to us personally and a detriment to society as a whole or to the human race as a whole? Just advancing our genetics. If we don't have any pressures, there's no selective breeding and eventually there will be a pressure and we won't have, not all of us will have the genes to overcome that bottleneck effect. Yes. And even on a psychology level, the amount of people who have had diseases and overcome them, they change. They're, they take a little bit more happiness on life. There's different attributes. There's like a lot of cancer patients are like, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but I'm happy it happened to me after they survive it because it's a huge changing experience. Having, having suck makes you appreciate the good much better. Like, you don't appreciate a glass of cold water when you're just lazing around in your living room. But after, like, a hard day's work, that water is straight from Jesus. It is fucking amazing. It's appreciation goes down if everything's handed to us. And it seems like we are... Why would why why do we exist if AI can make everything for us, nanobots can heal everything for us? Like, what's the point of living without struggle? I don't know. And that's... Like, that's the, that's the question, isn't it? Of how far do we go? How far do we change our bodies or our society, everything, in a way that helps it but doesn't destroy it, right? I mean, look, that's how AI works in every freaking movie. It's pro- might probably the same thing with this, where we're creating all this technology to save people and all, do all these good things, but at what cost to us in the long term? It's just... It, it's, if it seems too good to be true, right? <laughs> Nick, light speed's too slow. We'll have to go straight to ludicrous, ludicrous speed. speed. <laughs> oh. They've gone to play. <laughs> oh, I love space balls. But bring it back a little bit more grounded to Earth and modern day nanobots because it is very beneficial. It's a great tool in the toolbox, as Nick likes to say. The one I found extremely impressive is that nanobots might be able to heal scar tissue for those who don't know the reason why scar tissue doesn't match your skin color like it's different color it's how your skin grows back so it's like plug hole clot send white body blood cells aka pus to clean out infectant and then i can't remember what type of cross grow grows so it's like a scab and then it lines itself so it's skin so it's a different color but the reason why you might think oh well, who cares about a couple scars on my knuckles or et cetera, et cetera? Because that same technology can go into burn victims and their scar tissue. It might be a real possibility with nanobots to have simply bandages or uh, dressings on a burn victim that will fix their skin so it doesn't look like they got burned. So the burn victim no longer needs skin grafts. It just needs time and bandages. And that's amazing to me because i imagine a lot of burns are due to accidents i have no evidence to back this up but to fix that accident like nothing happened sounds wonderful and to add on to that with bandages and and dressings that's a huge part of the nano research field so greatly improved with nanobots can bandages can become they can become biodegradable help prevent infection with like silver ions like we mentioned earlier with silver and gold use a uh, chitosome which is like to help stop bleeding so if someone gets like a major cut it'd be like a pressure wound a uh, pe- pressure bandage what's it called trauma bandage nick what's it called when it's like a major cut and you're just kind of sealing it um you're talking about a bandage that has like a, a compression bandage when the pressure is applied and then there's like a trauma bandage is when there's like blood clotting stuff in mixed in with the bandage so you're talking about that one that one yeah yeah that could be more easily available and more efficient with nanobots and something as simple as keeping wounds dry so imagine in third world countries if you're near the equator it's moist it's like a rainforest area keeping wounds dry is really hard to do so simply having a bandage that could help keep your wound dry could stave off infections keep your skin from uh, stop from rotting away keep away bacteria help heal faster and if you heal faster it's less medical care needed, less resources used, less money used, less time used. It's benefits all around. Yeah, and I do want to go back a little bit when you're talking about scar tissue. So I broke both my bone, or broke my, both all the, oh, fuck me. <laughs> I broke both my hands 
and I had to get surgery to put the bones back together. And uh, the lady was, t when I was doing like the therapy and stuff to get my strength back, the uh, therapist, the physical therapist was telling me how one of the most important things to do is you have to rub the stuff, the anti-scar tissue stuff on it and massage it. And you have to break up that scar tissue because that tissue can attach to like your tendons and everything like that and caught may eventually make you lose some of the mobility and lead to uh oh what's it called when you can't bend this carpal tunnel mm, that too but there's uh ar arthritis t-rex nicks with arthritis anyway it's yeah so even little things like that reducing scar tissue i mean in the long term that's that's what it's all about right just minute improvements over time that lead to a better life which is what people are doing this for if you could get rid of everyone's arthritis that'd be pretty freaking awesome and you know even if you just get rid of it from like if you're a dumbass like me who broke both their hands wrists then i don't have to live with that the rest of my life and maybe that's a good and a bad thing you know you got to learn your lesson somehow right that was that is one of my favorite pictures of you nick i'm not gonna lie it's one of my favorite pictures of you no but you are right i didn't even think about arthritis like or like simple things like this like a lot of people lose cartilage just because of their job, their uh, car accident, maybe a sport they played. There's like no more knee left in their cart car and their cartilage left in their knee. Nanobots might give that little extra boost to help fix that, to help clear that up. Or uh, something as simple as like you get older and you start developing kidney stones. Now you could swallow a pill. Those nanobots go to the kidney stones, vibrate, which is something they can do, break up those kidney stones to be smaller. So instead of pissing out, I don't know, the size of a pebble you're pissing out dust which doesn't sound great but sounds a lot better than pissing out a pebble yeah i mean that's never had kidney stones hopefully never Knock will on one of my biggest fears <laughs> that, dude, that's, that's that's a whole trauma event emotionally that, that's gotta suck so bad but i kind of also want to double back a little bit with helping do surgeries like where ais and humans come together with nanobots at rice university they did a very interesting experiments now this is all lab work it's never been done in real field or anything like that but they welded two pieces of chicken flesh together now you might asking so that's where all my tuition is going to no 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 it's let me explain so what they did is they touched two pieces of chicken together this is like bare chicken breast or something like that no feathers or anything they poured a green liquid on there can you take a guess what that green liquid was nick uh mountain dew no, nope, they they get they might have the electrolytes that plants like, but they, they didn't have the what? Is it chlorophyll? <laughs> no, it was nanobots. It was a slurry of nanobots. Then once that slurry was placed onto those chickens, which were look at all those chickens, right where those chickens were uh, touching, they used UV or not UV. They used infrared lasers to weld the chicken skin together. Now you're like, so you welded flesh together. Bravo. This means complicated stitching. Like, there's a reason why triangle blades are illegal in the Geneva Convention because they're really, really, really hard to stitch together. Or if you get mangled in a car accident, they have a like a really complex stitching process. Really, really hard to do. Or somewhere where it's hard to see, where there's lots of blood, like doing a kidney or heart transplant. You could simply pour this green vial of nanobots on that opening or on that connection of in your body and simply just go around with a laser and ta-da it's completely sealed it's completely fixed it's you're done no more leaks no more ripping your stitches no more uh medical super glue which would have been great for my fingers but that to me sounds amazing like no more no more stitching because getting stitches sucks and just weld it together put on a patch to help with scar tissue and you're good to go which is all i would say within 40 years from right now with nanobot technology yeah and in 20 years we'll probably say it's about a year out it's just the the rate all this stuff is going no man can predict the future and i love it well nick before we for, go into well kind of out of left field i was wondering if you have any other information to recall or come back to no i'm good we can uh take this wherever you're about to bring it okay nanobots freaks me out a little bit because I have so many more questions that I can't, I can't answer. Can nanobots be hacked? Can nanobots get snagged on some body part inside you and cause like a clotted artery? How do nanobots leave the body that are already in? Like we want to use biodegradable bio nanobots, but we are not there yet. We're using like gold, silver, and platinum. 
Gold solar platinum don't decay that fast in human bodies. Where where all those nanobots go? Can you die from over injecting nanobots into you? How do you get them out of a human? Can you force someone to get a medical treatment by spraying nanobots or injecting them with nanobots? Like doing surgery against their will. Like say someone wants to die because they're old, they're miserable, and tired like that. So you just inject them with a needle and they're, they heal together. What, like how does that affect a, a attorney of health? Like it could, could if you have nanobots in your brain because you have like brain cancer or the, around the nervous system of your brainstem, could you change how a person feels emotions? Could that affect your brain chemistry? Could someone use that for evil and simply press a button and everyone who has that gets knocked out because it's like pinching the nerve so you all go limp for a bit like for bank robbers or 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 kidnappers or oh god there's so many questions nick so many questions so i'm assuming the way you get nanobots out is very similar to the matrix when they pull the bug out of me <laughs> <laughs> would humans have a drain plug for nanobots like like if you're in your bloodstream they go into your kidney can you get them like because they come in all different types of sizes, like 0.1 to 10 micrometers. Like, can that pass through everything to leave through your stool and urination? Or is that stuck? Or, like, like what happens if it does get snagged, doesn't leave? Can you, because, like, the one that reads your nervous system, lead, zirconium, titanium. Can you get an overdose accidentally of lead poisoning because you have a lead nanobot near some organ that shouldn't have it? Or what happens if you inject chemo? therapy drugs and nanobots and have them go to the wrong place chemo medicine's strong and dangerous what happens if it goes somewhere wrong what happens if it you have i don't know you're trying to fix your lymphoids and it accidentally goes to your eye will you go blind like what what's what's the safety measure like how do you stop nanobots once they're already in like we can control them with lasers oh i didn't ever, i never talked about that but uh, just a quick snap is so how we pretty much move them around is through electricity caused by heat so we shine lasers or infrared at them which makes their get micro voltage which makes them contract and flap they look they look kind of funny moving around or magnets they're simply attracted to the magnets they move around um ultrasound which is kind of just like pushing them i guess i guess the best way going back to kidney stones imagine getting ultraviolet to kidney stones to push or just free floating around but could, what's their i mean do you have to use an emp to i mean there's no electro really electrical sources they're just magnets or they're just materials that when heated or cooled they contract how do you stop them once they're already in you like what happens if you inject the wrong nanobots into the wrong person how do you stop that from completing their task I have no idea, and I have no imagination on how to do that, which is scary because I usually have some stupid idea. Nick, sorry, I kind of went into a panic there because I have no idea what I'm doing with nanobots. Yeah, I, I don't either. Um, and of course, I really didn't come across this, but humans will do this. Uh, can nanobots be weaponized? Oh, oh yes. Yes. So then, how do you? What's your defense against that? It's yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Good. Good old, good old warfare. Uh, I actually, I, I try to uh, look up defense against nanobots. The amount of tinfoil hat websites I came across and videos I came across was hilarious. I already hate flat earthers. I think I have a new, new hatred of anti nanobot defenders or whatever they call themselves. They. There's got to be a real way to defend against nanobots if you don't want it, especially when it comes to warfare. But the people on the internet who, I'm not joking, were quite literally wearing a tinfoil hat, just stop. Please stop. Don't do not do this. Just stop. No, but I don't know where it would lead to with Geneva Convention, like with nanobot technology. Like imagine, imagine releasing nanobots, a, a dust, like crop, crop dusting nanobots that let's just be ethical and say they're not going for humans, but say they go for gunpowder and guns and they destroy all the gunpowder. And when you come over the next the hill the next day, you just slaughter them all. That's a possibility. Or you make them all so sick they can't fight. I mean, it'd be, it, it, it wouldn't, countries that are trying to overthrow their government who might be an evil regime would have no chance. And if reading brains, emotions, and nervous system became more common, Someone could hit a button and just freeze you, turn you off in the middle of a gunfight. Or even worse, an ex-wife or a current wife could try to kill you when you're like skydiving or something. Like she, it, it, different ways of murdering people just increase tenfold. Yeah, so what you're telling me is 
like everything we talk about that there's a pros and cons to it yeah yeah all right i want i want to i want to bring it back to a happy note because this is where i hope uh nanobots go to which is uh biofilm bacteria nick do you are you familiar with biofilm bacteria i actually read a little bit about it when we were talking in uh yeah a while ago yeah Okay, for those who don't know, just a quick synopsis. There are really kind of two types of bacteria. There's kind of bacteria. Imagine imagine a, a circle, and inside that circle, there's just kind of free-floating bacteria. Those uh, with no structure, those, those ones are usually killed by blood cells or antibiotics. But then there's kind of like more serious ones where they make a structure. So imagine almost like a brick wall inside that circle. That brick wall is made of bacteria. That's kind of like bi- what biofilm bacteria is. That's really hard to kill because it's a wall. It's defending. It's trying to survive. And when people go to hospitals because of infection, it's usually biofilm. Now, granted, thankfully, with the modern science and antibiotics, a lot of those are taken care of. But a lot aren't. Actual biofilm uh, bacteria kills more people than cancer does. It's a larger range of different types of bacteria, so it's more diseases, but it does kill a lot. And nanobots might be able to literally break that up, make them loose, make them easier to kill, or physically kill them themselves. And that, to me, seems seems like the way to go for nanotech. I mean, it'd be nice to fix all our issues with nanotech, but kind of taking care of the important ones, like we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of them trying to fight and go against cancer. There's ones I didn't even mentioned just because there's so many trying to combat cancer. But I think bacteria seems simple enough that we could attack with nanobots which to me sounds sounds promising yeah it's you know not the the most uh difficult technology and it's we're already kind of there and you know you got to start somewhere and so let's start getting good at that use what we learned from that to go somewhere else i mean it's to me that seems like the easiest place to start right yeah i just start with simple illnesses or not simple, but common illnesses. So you all not only have a large sample size, but if you figure out how to effectively do it, you help a lot of people's lives. The future I see with nanobots is more affordable medicine. And if we could figure out how to program them better, we could have them dormant just floating around in their bloodstream. And when you get sick with something major, they'll activate and prevent. Or like you get in a car accident and you're bleeding a lot, they'll go and help clot faster or they if say your artery gets nicked or your lung collapse they'll help keep it propped up with like scaffolding and structures just kind of like a trauma kit for nanobots seems like a real real possibility but nick before we continue onward i i really hope nanobots go towards more biotech nanobots mainly because they will simply disintegrate they will dissolve they will disappear it it seems i don't know if it might just be emotions in there it seems more natural to have bio nanotechs in you than machine nanotechs it just seems like there's more options to do and say say you have a bad batch of bio nanobots which is that's a scary thought but you could introduce another chemical into your body to kill that natural biomaterial like it's hard to dissolve gold it's wow it's hard to dissolve gold and silver but to dissolve i don't know some stem cells seems a lot easier to do and it seems like a safety per measure of using biotech instead of traditional nanobots does that make sense yeah and look we all know everything that humanity makes works perfect the first time we make it <laughs> but yeah no i think that's the safest way you Unless we can figure out like a way to stop it, you know, using some kind of magnetic pulse or something to get rid of the not the inorganic nanotechnology. Yeah, but a, a magnetic pulse won't work on them because there's no circuitry. There's it's too simple a machine for an EMP to work on. That's that's why I'm, that's why I'm very cautious of not have. I like having I like having escape buttons. Like uh, it's just it's just nice uh, to hit the Alt F4 and turn off your computer real quick. Yeah, for sure. I mean. Uh, can you imagine having an undo button in surgery? That'd be pretty pretty nice, right? 
Holy crap, I didn't even think about that. That's a real possibility. Nick, all right, we got to break your hands again and try them with nanobots. Let's, let's, let's get on the ATV. Well, honestly, it wasn't the most painful experience of my life, so why not? <laughs> not? That was not the answer I was expecting. We'll do it in 10 years or so, and technology's there, right? All right, I'll get bit by bullet ants. You break your hands on the ATV, and then we go we go see the Greek fireworks. Yeah, there's there's uh, varying degrees of wants on that list that I want to do. <laughs> I can, I feel like number one is just get, watching me get bit by bullet ants, though. I feel like that's 100% number one. I want to see the look of I made a mistake. I, that's... Uh, uh, I, it, will be, it will be before we get on the plane, you'll see that, but fuck it, I'm down, let's do it. I, for those listening, though, I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on what nanotech could be used for or how you would improve nanotech. I mean, there's got to be diseases and issues that we didn't even think about that nanotech could solve for medical field. Again, nanotech is a jack of all trades. It can be used for a lot of things. So with this episode, we just kind of focused on medical, which you probably hear us talk about nanobots in a future episode and some other field. Maybe maybe a plant field because Nick didn't bring it up this entire episode. Anything about trees or plants, which, oh, I love it. We made it to the end and no trees and plants. I told you I was hungover. <laughs> <laughs> But out of curiosity, Nick, if they did want to share their opinion on what nanobots could be used for or where they could be used for, where could they find us? You can look for us on Instagram, and uh, you can listen to us on Spotify, and you cannot get us on Twitter. And for those curious, our sources are on our YouTube page on the description. Well, Nick, I hope nanobots don't take over the world like Skynet, and who knows, maybe nanobots will reach ludicrous speed and maybe because you have money you'll live to be 245 300 years old yes uh so with my medium level income i'll probably only get to like 150 nah just wait until i'm a billionaire i don't want to live forever but you can live forever yeah that's a whole nother podcast of what immortality means immortality means and if that's even a good idea and what it means to be human and we'll We'll get into that later. It, it seems, Nick, there's a lot of things leading towards the end of what we think is humans. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> last last of a dying breed. Well, Mike, uh, before we get out of here, what are you reading? I am reading The Rise and Fall of... Oh, no. I'm reading The Storm Before the Storm, which is about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire with uh, Sicinus, Julius Caesar. Kind of before their time, we'll kind of set all that up. What about you, Nick? What are you reading? Well, I pause the trilobite book for a little bit and for this one oh yeah i had to give up plastic injection that's why i switched books for this one i uh read radical evolution the promise and peril of enhancing our minds our bodies and what it means to be human by joel guru i think how'd you like them uh i really enjoyed it and it we kind of hit on a lot of the things he talked about of what it, it Will we continue to be humans? Are we going to have two classes of humans depending on what level of augmentation you want to do with technology that's coming up? And I'd recommend it. Good to know. Hey, Nick, can they find us on Twitter? Nope, we're not on Twitter because it's a dumpster fire. Oh, I love it every time. Well, thank you all for listening. I hope our two squirrel brains could bring some knowledge to nanobot technology. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>